Good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, we haven't done an Abacus video in a long time. I thought it would be a good opportunity to cover all the different kinds of Abacuses that I have in my collection and kind of talk about uh, the favorite abacus in each category and maybe what is my favorite overall abacus and then we might get into if you're looking to get started into collecting or learning how to use an abacus what would be a good way to start stay tuned Well, my abacus infatuation started when I was in high school. There was an Asian import store called Yanamoto's here in Albuquerque, and they had brand new Soroban from Japan, and they also had Kojima's first book on using the abacus. Uh, having to save money up in high school to get my first abacus doing yard work and things like that, finally got my first one. But since then, since being an adult, I've noticed abacuses periodically. I find them in thrift stores and antique stores, and most most of these abacuses came from those kind of stores. There's a couple of them that I've bought commercially uh, online now that online sales are so prevalent and you can buy just about any kind of abacus if you're willing to spend the money. Some are very inexpensive and some are quite expensive actually. So one of the things I noticed as I began collecting the abacus is there were different traditions of construction and design, especially in Asia where you have the Japanese Soroban style abacus and then over in China the Xuan Pan style. Uh, style uh, Chinese abacus. They each have their own traditions of how they're built and then even these little 10 bead abacuses seem to be consistent in the way they're built as well. So different cultures have uh, derived the abacus uh, through many, many centuries of development and use. And so it's kind of interesting to see those commonalities. And so let's begin with probably the most common kind of abacus you'll see in a thrift or antique store is the traditional Chinese 5-2 abacus. Yeah, so this one is a fairly large one and you'll often see similar kinds of design characteristics. Uh, the frames are not really well made. Uh, the, the joinery is very rather, rather crude and the paint job on a lot of these is rather crude. You can kind of see here it's just crudely painted. One of the notable features is they use this thin sheet metal brackets to anchor the dividing bar and also to anchor anchor the corners here. And so it's just a common feature you'll see in these, uh, what I call, these are quote, kind of what I call tourist abacuses, uh, because these they're often sold more as decoration than actual abacuses. But this one did come with a little brief instruction manual on how to operate the Chinese abacus. So this is typical of the kind of abacus you'll see in a tourist shop or whatever, a 2-5 abacus. Here's another one that is very similar and you can see the same kind of design characteristics. The beads have the same kind of oval look and they're not really well formed like this bead right here is kind of really crudely shaped and the paint jobs are never really nice. Again, the, the thin sheet metal brackets uh, holding it together. This one is made in China, has a little sticker, uh, a metal label put in there with brads. So again, the, the finish of the wood and the paint is really rather crude on these. This 2.5 abacus though is a lot more interesting to me. It is a hybrid abacus between a Japanese and an, a Chinese style. And what's interesting about it is the frame is entirely Japanese style construction, as are the beads. The beads have this biconic shape to them that is very indicative of the Japanese Soroban. It has the dividing bar that's laminated with a thin central strip of light colored material with dots for your commas and your thousands and your decimal places. And the joinery you might notice on the edge here has these little metal pins that are holding these dowels in place on the back side that hold these frames in place. So these little metal bushings, I guess you call them, are, are just one of the features of a Japanese Soroban. And again, it's using some rather nice joinery on the corners. So um, a little bit better construction technique than the uh, traditional tourist abacus that you might see, right? But in a Japanese Soroban style, 
And then I have another one that's very similar. It's a Japanese Soroban style 2.5, but it has colored beads. And I'm assuming this is an aid in learning the abacus. Maybe place values can be assigned colors or whatever. Again, a very similar construction, although this one does not have the little metal bushings on the brackets. Um, it does have this characteristic curvature to the side frames that almost all Japanese Soroban do have, which is interesting. And it has a back plate, trademark made in Japan by Daruma. So there you go. So a colored bead 2.5 hybrid to, uh, abacus. Now, as far as what is my favorite 2.5 abacus in my collection, well, it's really got to be one of these two, I would say. And I'm personally not really a fan of using the 2.5 abacus because the way I use the abacus, I only need the beads to represent numbers 0 through 9. And so because you have, you can represent 15 on a row, the extra 1 bead and the extra 5 bead end up becoming kind of distraction, a distraction for me, at least the way I use the abacus. So I don't really like a 2.5 abacus at all. But if I had to choose between either of these, I probably would just take this one with the traditional Asian hardwood beads. Now these, by the way, you might be able to tell, have some discoloration on them like this abacus probably got wet, uh, it looks like, at one point, time or another. But it's held up quite well, which is a testimony to the quality of its construction. Well, the Japanese inherited a lot of their cultural artifacts from China. They originally inherited the 2.5 abacus, but soon afterwards they got rid of the extra five bead and so for many centuries the Japanese Soroban was a one five configuration. I have two of those examples in my collection. I have this one which I got from a antique store in Silver City, New Mexico of all places. You know you kind of wonder how does a, a one five Soroban get into a, a, an antique store in Silver City. <laughs> the other one that I have in my collection comes in this uh, nice box, kind of a simulated alligator skin uh, box and it is a modern uh, very variation on the 1.5 abacus. So this uh, abacus has very similar construction elements to it as the old one. You might be able to see in the case of both of them, the side frame has a slight curve to it here and here, which is just another element of the Japanese style. There is the finger joinery on the corners as well and a bottom plate that both uh, abacuses have. Um, both of these have metal rods and the dividing bar is almost the same thickness, roughly a quarter of an inch. And they both have kanji characters that illustrate the uh, different place values of yen. And you might notice that there is a, a central a rod that does not have any kanji and it's divided into two halves and I believe it is like a debit credit kind of a ledger system. You put your losses on one side and your gains on the other and I think that's how these were used. Also you might notice that the beads, the size of these beads are for adult fingers, uh, unlike the school kid learning abacuses which we'll look at later. Okay, the newer abacus though you can tell probably the frame is, is newer grade of wood. It's stained or some kind of finish on the outside, but the inside of the frame here is evident that it's it's not stained on the inside. Um, and of course the beads are plastic, right? These are plastic biconic beads. Whereas the uh, older abacus here, it looks like they're brass rods and they're slightly smaller in diameter than the newer one. And, but these are traditional hardwood beads. And it also has these interesting brackets in the middle. So there is a bracket here with some kind of a pegs like that are inserted into the gaps. So this is sort of classic Japanese joinery. You see this kind of construction even in their traditional buildings. Um, the back plate looks like it's been attached with metal brads and they look quite old and then there are some pencil scribbles on the back side like some kid was at one time scribbling on it but it's beautiful wood. This one right here is my favorite, my most prized one. In fact, this is probably the most prized one of them, my entire collection, only because it was really the first antique abacus that uh, was designed for adults and probably used in commerce that I collected. And by the way, the 1.5 abacus became the 1.4 modern 
soroban in Japan sometime in the first half of the 20th century. So this could be as far back as the early 20th century, this one right here. Now, as far as a 1.5 abacus being a usable abacus to learn the Soroban on, yeah, I think you could get around the fact that there's an extra bead that you don't really need. If it was my preference, I would be learning on a 1.4 abacus. Oh, and I should show you, I have another 1.5 abacus I realized here. This one is a more modern one. This is not old at all. It says vintage, but it's, it's not really. It's only a few years old. Looking just from the age of the wood, the cuts in it, uh, the wood is not really oxidized that much. It is a modern Japanese 1.5, and this is what interests me, is that in the evolution of the Soroban, or the abacus, the 1.4 is considered the most modern as far as the development of the abacus, and yet different Asian cultures got used to their kind of abacus, and so you'll still see 1-5 abacus is being used in some cultures. You'll see 2-5, the Chinese kind, being used commonly in Asia, even though in China, when they use the 2-5 abacus, they just usually ignore the extra beads, and they really use it like a 1-4. Well, okay, well, let's get into the 1-4 abacus. This one on top here is one of my more recent uh, finds, and it was a local thrift store kind of find. It's adult size beads, nice biconic Japanese beads, uh, metal rods, and a, a large heavy frame. But what I like about it is it only has nine rods. And for me, m the general use that I would have on an abacus on my desk is really for addition and subtraction. I don't need the extra rods for multiplication and division. And it makes it just a smaller, more compact abacus to store on your desk. Again, it has this traditional construction technique of this inner bracket which has the joinery. And it's interesting the way they built this because you don't really need this bracket with a back plate. The back plate stabilizes the entire frame, but the older abacuses without the bottom plate, they used that central bracket as a way to hold the frame together. So it was just a tradition that they stuck with. And again, you'll notice the curve on the side of the frame, that's traditional. And even the dividing bar has its own little joinery coming out here. You'll notice the condition of this abacus, there is a split in the wood, right? So that's something you'll see on some of these abacuses that they do have that condition. You can see the joinery right there. Um, this one, there is some kind of masking tape put along the back here that covers up those metal brads and probably makes a, uh, a smoother surface so it doesn't scratch your desk and that was probably an add-on by somebody. But I got a whole box of 1-4 Sorobans in my collection. Ignore the swish, that has nothing to do with it. Okay, this is an abacus that you can buy online from Amazon or other online sellers. And it is a 1-4 Soroban made in China, and it has elements of the classic 1-4 Japanese Soroban. However, the beads are kind of a hybrid type bead. They do have a ridge, but they're not totally straight-sided biconic like the Japanese style. They're kind of lozenge-shaped. They're not finished to the high degree you would expect of a Japanese bead. They're painted. Interestingly enough, the top bead on every four rows is a slight light brown color compared to the others that are solid black. Interestingly enough, for a Soroban, it has the Chinese style construction of these little metal corner gussets with brads holding it together. The construction of it is kind of primitive, but on the other hand, it has some modern features that kind of makes it quite usable. First of all, there's three rubber feet. There's two on this side and one on the other side. And you might think, why use three feet? Why not four? Well, the obvious reason is with three feet, it'll never wobble. The problem with four feet is you would have to very carefully align the frame to keep it from wobbling. But three feet is always stable like a tripod. So that's interesting. So having a rubber foot means it's not going to slide around on your desk. However, the most innovative part of this abacus is this push button right here. And this is the automatic clearing system. That's what makes these 
abacus is so quick to use. And you'll see on the back the push button that goes to a bell crank system and there's two sets of rods here. There's two bell cranks here and here and it just separates those rods apart and pushes the beads back to the home position. Kind of quick and dirty construction, not the fine quality craftsmanship you would expect of a Japanese Soroban, but a more modern feature, quick to clear it and get back to your operation. Okay, this is another modern Soroban. These are made in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has its own Soroban culture. Uh, this is a school kids learning Soroban and because it's plastic doesn't mean it's low quality. In fact I find I like overall this construction quality better than I do this primitively made wooden one, right? So it has a molded plastic frame but it has a uh, elements that look like a traditional Japanese soroban in the way the brackets are made. The dividing bar has the dots every four rows for your decimal point and the commas in the thousands. Um, it is Japanese biconic shaped beads. They're plastic, but they have the ridge like you want. Uh, but the big thing that keeps me from using this abacus, practically speaking, it's a school kid's abacus. The beads are small, and for my stubby fingers, they're just a little bit too small for comfort. But I do like this abacus. This was a gift from a Taiwanese lady who lived here in New Mexico and taught uh, school. So she gave that to me, and I really of value that heavily. So these others are mostly all thrift store finds and I probably shouldn't go through all of them. Here's a little brass desktop Soroban. It's just too small to practically use, but it has the nice sharp edged brass biconic beads. So then you get into the kind like this that has the original packing label or stocking label. Students Abacus it's really too small for my fingers, but you'll notice the construction. It has these metal gussets around the dowels, and there's even little metal pins that hold the gussets in place. Uh, so it's pinned, and the construction is just really wonderfully made. It is a, a finger joinery on the corners. Again, it has that traditional curve to the side pieces. The laminated dividing bar with the white strip there and the little dots. This is all just wonderfully made Japanese construction. But what I wanted to show you is the finer quality Soroban, like for instance this one, is just wonderful. This kind of rose colored wood, uh, all of the metal on these brackets, the uh, level of attention to detail to make this an, an abacus that will last for generations. It's just wonderful. And then this one here I got recently and it has a lot of the same quality joinery. You see the all these metal gussets there, but it has this metal frame brackets, a, a U-shaped bracket on both sides. It's an inset into the frame, so it's flush. Uh, so another level of attention to detail, just in terms of rigidity and how long it's going to last. Uh, again, this is the kind of a student's abacus that would last the student their entire career in school and onward into adulthood. So this Sorban is a gift from my friend Bill. It has this alligator skin simulated pattern box. This says Dr. Something P. Dobbins from San Something, California has an address label on the top of it. I don't know if the rest of the ad address is in the box. I don't think it is. There's another label here that says Perkins Abacus Service, 3527 Nottingham Way, Hamilton Square, 90, New Jersey. And I believe the research I did on this, this is related to the Perkins School of the Blind that Helen Keller went to. And they were uh, using uh, a variation on the abacus to teach students, uh, blind and deaf students. So, uh, so this abacus, again, a student's abacus, it is is Japanese made. It has the metal reinforcement that are pinned and it has those side brackets of metal that are uh, flush with the frame. So very durable, rugged, well-made, wonderful abacus. Again, uh, the only downfall you might say to it in terms of being an adult with stubby fingers is the size of the beads. I might also want to mention if you catch the light just right on these beads, 
the finish on them is just wonderful. And the grain structure of this Asian wood they're using is just wonderful. I think it's boxwood or something, but just the way these things are polished, just wonderful artifacts to look at. This is a good opportunity to get into the Russian abacus or the shiakti. This is a 10-bead abacus. It was traditionally used in the calculation of monetary exchange and basically rubles and kopecks, which is why one of the columns uh, typically only has three or four beads because of the denomination of kopeck. The frames on these are typically tapered and they're actually used like this oriented so you move the beads sideways instead of up and down and you'll notice that the rods are curved right they're arched so when you move a bead from one side to the other there's a uh, very little chance that it's going to accidentally fall over to the other side you'll also notice the cross section of these beads it's kind of like the japanese soroban in terms of having a central ridge but it's even more extreme and it really makes for really good ergonomics because you can get your fingers in between these beads really easily and can move them quite readily without any confusion. And some of the videos I've seen online of people using the traditional Russian abacus in modern settings is the advantage of this abacus is the beads are large and they're, they're divided into these colors. And so the whole idea is for when a merchant is calculating an exchange, he wants his customer to see the calculation proceed. The customer watches the beads move and can verify that the calculation is correct because he can count the beads as they're being added on. So th there's kind of an interesting element of trust about how this abacus works compared to like an electronic uh, point of sale adding machine where you don't know if there's some hidden markup being you know, add it onto your price, right? And some of these videos I've seen, the store will have a modern point of sale cash register and one of these. And the clerk will do the calculation on the adding machine and then he'll redo the calculation for the person to see so they can verify the numbers are correct. Well, it's a 10 bead abacus. There's 10 beads in each row, and obviously it's you can represent numbers 0 through 9 plus an extra bead, which you don't really need, actually. In modern number systems, you only need 0 through 9. But I really do like the simplicity of the 9 or the 10 bead abacus. In the 19th century, when Napoleon invaded Russia. When his, his army left Russia, they left Russia with the culture of the Russian abacus. And the 10-bead abacus came into use in French schools. And this is an abacus. It's quite old, as you might be able to tell. It is a simple 10-bead abacus, five rows. And I assume it's a school abacus, but it's not the kind of abacus you might see in America with made of plastic bright colored beads. These are wonderfully painted with the pastel colors and they have all their own patina and crazing on the, the paint finish. It's just a wonderful old abacus and this is the kind of an abacus that they probably would have used in French schools. And then more recently I found a modern version of the same kind. So you'll notice the frame on this one is kind of a U-shaped frame, two simple blocks of wood that are screwed into the main block, and those have the holes for the rods. Well, you can see on this more modern version, they're kind of using the same philosophy. Two side pieces with grooves, a piece of lucite plastic as a back plate, and then holes in each bracket for the rods. The rods here are, are again, metal. 10 beads, the color scheme is different and divided into two groups of five. And the shape of these beads is sort of a hybrid between round and the soroban style. There is a slight ridge in the middle, right? So a good question is, would one of these 10 bead abacuses be a good way to start uh, learning the abacus? And I would say yes, although I would actually say the 9 bead abacus would be even more preferred. And you'll find that it's difficult to find 9 bead abacuses anywhere. Uh, this is actually a commercially made 9 bead abacus. This is the only one I've seen. These are very cheaply made in China. The construction quality is quite low. The frame is very crudely made and kind of 
not even very well lacquered. It's just kind of, you know, really poorly made, but it uses these plastic pseudo Japanese Soroban beads in a 9B configuration. So if you don't want to build your own 9 bead abacus, you can buy these on Amazon very inexpensively. So if you guys are interested in learning more about the abacus, um, first of all, probably the two most classic books is by Takashi Kojima, the Japanese abacus, its use and theory. This teaches the traditional Japanese method of using the 1-4 Soroban most efficiently. And then he had a follow-up book called Advanced Abacus Theory and Practice. So these two books are available. They're great books, you know, to learn the, the right way to do the abacus, the 1-4 Soroban. People do occasionally ask me, uh, what is it that you like about the abacus? It seems such a simple device. Well, I'm sure part of it is because I first got interested in him when I was in high school, but I think it is a combination of the history of the abacus that they've been found in so many different cultures dating back to the ancient Greeks and even earlier in different variations throughout medieval Europe in the case of the counting board and throughout Asia in different variations that we've seen here. Uh, so the history, uh, the fact that they're physical, simple devices that you can still use today for simple operations like addition and subtraction. Also, I think there is a tactile nature of the abacus that is very enjoyable for me. Very similar to the manual typewriter, um, you have the feel of the beads, the, just the feel of them on your fingers, the sound they make when the beads move, the physical simplicity of them, and the fact that you can do practical things with them. And also, they're small and they are easy to collect. And they're, you can make a pretty sizable collection of them and they won't take up all that much room. So for a lot of reasons, I really find them to be a lot of fun. There's another element of the abacus hobby I should mention is that uh, a lot of people get really deeply into learning to operate the abacus very efficiently and very fast, including graduating to the level where you can actually operate the abacus mentally. That is, you can picture a soroban in your mind and you can become very adept at a mental arithmetic. I've not been interested in that element of the abacus hobby, but there is that side of it, the performance side of it. It is not only an, a fun object to operate, but it can be a, uh, a skill that you can learn to use over your lifetime and get better and better at. Well, if you're interested in getting started learning the abacus, I really recommend getting an abacus with adult size beads for adult size fingers. Uh, this kind, this 1-5 abacus, you can kind of find uh, sometimes online with plastic beads, but I really think uh, a 1-4 abacus is going to do you better because they're just more efficient to operate. So uh, this Yellow Mountain Imports brand that's on Amazon, this um, inexpensively made 1-4 abacus with the automatic clearing system, I think that's a good starter abacus. It's not really that expensive and I'll leave a link down below to it. Uh, the other option is if you have smaller hands, uh, if this size bead is works well for your fingers, these inexpensive Taiwanese-made uh, plastic uh, Soroban are really also a good way to start in with the 1-4 uh, Soroban. And also, if you're crafty, however, uh, you might want to consider making a 9-bead abacus for yourself. I've made a number of 9-bead abacuses, and I find they're really easy to learn to make. But other than that inexpensive little uh, Chinese one that's poorly made, I really haven't seen any other 9-bead abacuses online, so you'll have to build one of those yourself. But for starting out, um, an adult size 1-4 Soroban inexpensively is really a great way to get started in the abacus hobby. And of course, once you get into that, it's just like collecting typewriters. Then you'll start going, perhaps, to... Um, thrift stores and antique stores, and then you might start noticing antique abacuses that are will be fun to add to your collection. Keeping in mind that a lot of those very traditionally made Japanese Soroban are very expensive now online. If you had to buy them new, they can run upwards of hundreds of dollars, whereas I've bought them in thrift stores for just 10 or $20 usually, because now they're considered to be traditional craft products of Japanese culture, and they do export for quite a bit of money now. So pick yourself up uh, Kojima's first book, at least. I'll leave the link down below for that as well. And if you have any other questions about the Abacus, the Soroban, 
the history of them or whatever, I'd love to have a discussion with you. Leave a comment down below if you would. And also, we're getting now toward the end of the year 2020. What a year it's been. But I wish you guys the very best for the coming year. I hope you stay healthy physically, mentally, spiritually, and stay creative also. And until next time, have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.